Welcome, guys, to How the Frack We Got Here, a show that takes the news and events of the week and try to make sense out of it all. I'm your host, the most will be can, on this show, we simply are all about the facts. There are plenty, plenty, plenty of mutations out there that simply want to do anything short but inform you. Here at How the Frack We Got Here, that's all we believe in. We go after the left, we go after the right, we go after the middle of the independence. We go after all sides because there's more than one side of a story to everything. And you need to know it all in order to actually get the order in order to actually formulate your own opinion. And that's what we try to do here how the friend we got here. Thanks for listening and uh, hold on. It's gonna be fun. All right, guys. Today's date, December 15, 2021, and this is how the frack we got here. I'm Rose most, most Will Buchanan on how the frack we got here. We do take the events of the week and try to make sense of it all. Uh, before I do get started, guys, let's you know, guys, that this is a family-friendly podcast, or at least we try to be. Uh, so we do try to watch our language, but sometimes words do fly, and at the same time, there may be things that might be shown that might be too intense for younger viewers, so viewer discretion is advised. Aside from that, welcome. So, um, as we get closer to that wonderful time of the year, and I'm not talking about Spider-Man No Way Home that comes out tomorrow for some of us, um, and I'm not talking about that Jolly Saint Nick guy that's a pagan holiday that comes out next week, we get to see what's going on in the news in this midweek review, and again, I have to start off with this. Um, of course, if you're, if you're, of course, if you're seeing what I'm seeing right now, guys, uh, Biden plans to restart federal's, um, it tries again because apparently words are escaping me at the moment. Biden still plans to restart federal loan payments in February. For all those that have student loans, me and me, a present company included, are all facing the fact that student loans have been on pause since the beginning of this pandemic. However, uh, President Biden still plans to restart loan payments in February, even though his fellow Democrats are calling for an extension of uh, due to the coronavirus and the Omicron variant that is now starting to replace the Delta and Mu variants out there. Of course, um, of course, from the White House Press Secretary Jim Plaskey says, quote unquote, we're still assessing the impact of the Omicron variant, but a smooth transition back into repayment is a high priority for the administration. In the coming weeks, we'll release more details about our plans and we'll engage directly with student loan borrowers to ensure they have the resources they need and are in the appropriate repayment plan. Y'all, I have sat there and said this so many times. Um, and there's been massive debate. However, here's the one thing I've never understood. Why in this day and age are student loans not forgiven? I mean, forget the fact if you're a part of that group of, well, you, you're responsible for what you borrow. Yes, so are banks and businesses, but they get bailed out all the time. So are industries like the automotive industry, the airline industry, and they got bailed out by the government. Um, the people who took those PV, those uh small business people and those people who faked they had a small business that took those PPP loans, those loans got forgiven. So why in the blue do us, especially us in the, in the, um, how can I say it so nicely, us who were former students who took out loans are still like, well, you still got to pay them. I mean, this is the part where, again, I, I was very, very disappointed because Joe ran on this whole thing of, and I and I will say this about President Biden, he did not say, he would not commit, he would not commit to an overall forgiveness of student debt, which again, a lot of progressives out there were pushing to do. A lot of progressives were saying, um, if you did forgive the, well, was it $1.7, $1.9 trillion student loan debt, if that was forgiven, that immediately a lot of people's financial and credit portfolios would be uplifted. And of course, Biden said, well, I mean, we can't really do that. But I mean, we can forgive at least $10,000, which, by the way, still hasn't happened. I mean, he's forgiven um, the PSL loans, public service loans, and those who were screwed over by for-profit uh, colleges. But the rest of the world, yeah, I mean, the rest of us, you're like, you still got to pay them. Now, don't get me wrong. In a, in a better society where we actually got the jobs we got for the degrees that we went for, I would wholeheartedly agree because that used to be the system. The system was you basically took a loan. Oh, think of it as an investment in your future. But if that future does not provide the jobs with the pain, with the, the jobs, with the, I'm sorry, provide the careers with the uh, salaries that do come with these degrees earned, then it's almost like, why am I still held responsible? And I know a lot of people out there are like, but you took the loans out. 
you paid them, or my personal favorite, my personal favorite out there, which I still find amazing, where people sit there and go, well, I paid those loans with no problem. So if I was able to do it, you should be able to do it. Yes, I kid you not. There are some folks out there that had this mentality. And again, I keep saying this all the time. If you had the, if you had the ability to pay off for student loans, bravo. I mean, I'm not saying it can't be done. I am saying that it's very, very difficult, especially if you have other things, if you have utilities, if you have uh, uh, mortgage payments, if you have rent, if you have a child, if you have um, other financial obligations, then paying back your student loans, which again is the greatest scam ever because um, the ridiculous finance fees and interest rates that they put on this, it, it's, it's utterly ridiculous. And at the same time, guys, I keep pointing this out that um, they will, I mean, loans follow you until the end and keep in loans prevent people from, and this thing I say about student loans, student loans prevent people from getting homes, from um, getting better credit, because again, that hits your, that hits your credit report to your debt, to your debt, to your debt, to uh, uh, your debt, to uh, wealth. I'm sorry, that's wrong. Your how much money you have versus your debt. It was something to debt ratio. And I'm and it's pretty bad that I don't remember that right now. But basically, if it, if your debt is outdoing your assets in that sense, creditors won't even take a chance on you. And a lot of people that have student debt, again, I'm part of that crowd, have that issue. I mean, we would love to go for homes. We would love to go for, you know, get a nice car, or get a nice home, or be able to go and get a business loan. We would love to be able to do all that. The problem is that a lot of lenders and creditors will look at that and say, oh, you have student loans that need to get paid. I don't know if we can help you. I'm so sorry. And this is why I keep saying the entire time, Biden, Biden right now has the chance to be the most progressive president ever and sit there and actually forgive student loans. Uh, uh, Warren has pushed forward. Bernie Sanders has pushed forward. A lot of the progressives out there have pushed forward. They really want these student uh, these student uh, loans to be forgiven. And why not? Because again, it's in the, in the argument I'll make on that is they keep saying we don't have the money. Keep in mind, they just turned around and just gave the Department of Defense uh, an additional 700 plus billion dollars. They gave the defense fund. They gave these. They gave the. They gave the defense. The sec. They gave the Department of Defense out there a seven hundred billion dollar extension in funds. Keep in mind, guys, the Pentagon cannot account for the last thirty. For the last four decades, they cannot account for the money and funds that's been allocated to them. They can't account for it. The Pentagon can't. The Department of Defense can't. And yet, we are still writing out billions of dollars to them and they can't account for it. So miss me with the BS that we cannot forgive student loans when we can keep pouring money into our defense that nobody can explain nor account for. So Biden, I'm going to be honest with you on this. It's one of those things where I said before, if he forgave student debt, I mean, this is the thing. It's like, it's like Biden is afraid of progressive movement. Like Biden won't speak out that the Supreme Court is basically doing women wrong. He won't speak out that, yes, that, you know, in the in the case of Kyle Rittenhouse, well, you know, the America, you know, the jury did its job. He won't speak out. It's like, dude, you cannot remain a centrist. Centrist presidents literally don't remain centrist. I mean, if you do, then you have no support. And Biden is all intents and purposes a centrist president. Now, at the same time, it's amazing what else will be slightly what else will be sent through Congress. But when it comes to student loan debt, it's like, what are what are we waiting for? And like, didn't Harris and Biden run on this to a certain extent? And Harris, Lord knows where she's been this entire time. I mean, the first the first African American VP, and you rarely hear from her. But that's a whole other story. But anyway, I, I'm, I need to get off my rant. Move right along, guys. I did actually want to cover this story as well. Um, again, we bring up Mansion. Manchin signals major changes needed to win his support on Biden's safety net plan. I cannot stress this enough because, again, the Democrats have a very slim majority in the Senate. Keep in mind, Biden's Build Back Better plan is still out there hovering and needs every Democratic vote in order for it to pass. 
However, there's still two de- there's still two Democrats, which acting more Republican these days, are still not committing to it. Manchin is one of them. Manchin, who basically is a walking conflict of interest because he comes from West Virginia, a coal state, and he's actually on a board that actually is for a coal production business and is a multimillionaire. Figure that out. Again, there's no such thing as a broke politician. But he also says, as he reported to CNN, he indicated on Monday that a significant amount of work remains to be done on to earn his support on Joe Biden's uh, social safety net expansion. Um, again, this is what he does. The concerns he's raised, the concerns is where Manchin is set at, uh, suggest that he needs to see wholesale changes to the bill, um, but not saying what it is. I got some ideas, because keep in mind, Manchin, above all else, he, for a, Demo- for a Democrat, Manchin hates a lot of things in the bill. Number one, he hates maternity leave. He hates that. He hated maternity leave. He hated, um, he actually hated the Medicare expansion, which again, Medicare was going to correlate now includes only just health. It does not include dental and vision, which is amazing to me that the Medicare, the Medicaid expansion does not cover not just health, dental, and vision, but just health. But dental and vision are just important too. And Manchin didn't want that included. He also did not want um, to talk about increasing the minimum wage. Think about that. That's three progressive things in the bill Manchin has said that cannot be done. Because again, he doesn't want, it's like he likes the fact, like most people who are multimillionaires in a political stance, um, he acts more Republican than he does Democrat. And now he's and now he's going to be, as I've said it before, he's going to be the potential roadblock that he's the he is the Christmas gift that Republicans didn't ask for, but they're certainly not complaining about. Between him and Christian Cinema, those two de- those two people are the Christmas presents Republicans didn't ask for, but they're grateful for because unfortunately, if all Democrats do not actually sign on to this, then for some fact matter, the bill's dead. And it is amazing to me because Democrats will not have a leg to stand on come the midterms next year. And again, I keep pointing this out. Republicans, even though they have done nothing this entire term, this entire term, they have pretty much, the only thing they did was vote no on everything. They did not submit bills. They did not suggest new laws except for, you know, the abortion, which again, no Republican said anything about it. So the Supreme Court sat there and said, oh, well, we'll let this stand, but you providers can sue. All Republicans came out there, all Republicans came out there as, 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 pro, as pro-life individuals, which is, again, a stupid term. But again, this is the whole point I'm making about Democrats. Your picture right now is not looking good for 2022. Even though Republicans don't have a leg on to stand themselves, you guys, for some fact of the matter, it's just that you have to prove that, hey, we gave you guys the majority in Congress, the House, the Senate, and the presidency. What have you done? Especially for people of color, because I've said it once, I've said it again, Biden's Biden's hardest, Biden's hardest challenge at this point is what he's done for people of color. I hate to say that because he's done so much for so many other groups, but what has he done for people of color lately? And again, that's going to be a major hurdle, aside from the fact that minimum wage still hasn't been increased, aside from the fact that, you know, maternity leave and paternity leave is being reduced. It went from literally 12 weeks of 12 weeks now back to now down to six. Now, last time I checked down to four. So, again, it's amazing to me in this so-called first world country that other countries have gotten it better than we have. And again, with Biden, and the Democrats, you're going to have a hard hard time in 2022 because the list of accomplishments that you're going to have is going to be very short compared to the Republicans are saying, well, this is what happened when we give all Democrats power. They want to push a vaccine mandate. They want to push vaccines on you guys that you didn't need for the, for a, for a, for COVID. And they said to do this and do that. And has your life been better since Biden's been president? That's all I got to say, because a lot of, because a lot of people out there who are conservatives are fucking idiots. And I hate to say that. I mean, I don't mean to use the F word, but it's true. They're idiots. They will sit there and anything that Republicans say, they will turn around and eat it up. And that's why the midterms 
for Democrats are going to be difficult, not because of the fact that they cannot get anything done. It's the fact that they have a lack of things that made people's lives better immediately. Sure, you may have passed the America Emergency Plan, the America First Plan, and gave everybody a nice stimulus stimulus check. But again, this is why I say the Democrats, when they push this forward, um, especially the Senate Democrats, who are multimillionaires versus the House, who seem to be more, of course, versus the House Democrats, who seem to be more connected with us. That's why I said there's such a big disconnect because they said they said, well, that stimulus check that we got you guys, that's helped out, right? Yeah, for like a few bills and that's it. You act like that $1,400, you act like that $1,500 is going to get us through a couple months. So again, I point this out that Democrats are going to have a harder time making their case in the midterms than it will be Republicans trying to convince their idiotic base that, hey, Y'all guys gave him a shot. Is your life any better? And speaking of Democrats, this uh, latest news that comes up, I'm not going to lie, it concerns me just a little bit because it tells me that with the Democratic uh, standpoint that nothing is going to change. CNN House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has made a decision to stay in her leadership post until after at least the midterm elections and perhaps beyond. Now, Pelosi, who turns 82 next year, had previously set the year 2022 as a more or less target date for retirement. But sources familiar with her thinking say she hasn't ruled out extending her 20-year run as the House's top Democrat. So how do people on Capitol Hill feel about that idea? Well, for that, I want to bring in one of my excellent and still new-ish, new-ish colleagues, reporters <laughs> behind this story, uh, Isaac Devere. And Isaac, look, we were talking about it before you came on. This is something everyone's talking about in the Democratic caucus on Capitol Hill, just not publicly, <laughs> which I think is one of the more interesting dynamics about it. And so the details that you have in this piece, at, at least from my end, as somebody who's been up there for a long time, were fascinating. What was kind of your takeaway in talking to the caucus about the mood right now amongst Democrats when it comes to the speaker and what she may do? Well, look, they have this weird mix of emotions. They are ready for the new chapter of Democratic leadership, but they are also really worried about what things will look like when Pelosi is gone. She is a, uh, an iconic leader, but she's also a strong leader of the caucus. And even though they say they see reasons, especially in the infrastructure negotiations, where it seems like her control has slipped somewhat, to not have that control at all when the new leadership comes in, they're terrified of that, and given the factionalization that's overtaken a lot of parts of the, the Democratic caucus. And, and one of the things, look, the top three leaders in the House Democratic Caucus are all in their 80s, yeah. I believe. They've been there for years, as the Republican leadership has changed pretty much every 24 hours to some degree. Um, what about what's coming next? I think everybody has ideas about who the next one or two or three people may be. Where's the caucus on that? Are they settled on who would follow the Speaker? Well, one of the things that I have in the story is that Jim Clyburn, the House whip, there had been some uh, speculation that he might want to come in as an interim uh, choice. And he told me, as I was reporting the story, he is not planning to be Speaker. He does not. He's not interested in that. He's not waiting Pelosi out either. Okay. So here's the problem I have with this. Again, the Senate, the Senate, uh, of course, right now, Pelosi is the House uh, leader. I keep forgetting Chuck Schumer is currently the Senate majority leader. But the uh, Speaker of the House, uh, Nancy Pelosi, um, says that she wants to remain on. And here's a thing that has always bothered me, that with Democrats, again, I feel like the, the nothing is changing. Because you have, I mean, the Democratic Party as a whole is going progressive. I mean, you can see in the House a lot more uh, progressive individuals, uh, AOC, Eliana Omar, and a, and a handful more, are, are starting to gain more seats um, in the Democratic Party, especially in the House. The Senate, however, just seems to be a whole bunch of older generation folks that seem to be more centrist and moderate and pretty much moderate Republicans, because that's what they pretty much that's what pretty much centrist Democrats are. Um, but what bothers me about this is that, OK, Pelosi is a very intelligent woman. She is she is a she is a tough negotiator. But when does it come at one point that we realize that we probably need to start saying limitations on Senate's and um those that run in the House and those that run in the Senate. How is it by now we haven't figured out that, of course, we put the president on two, two consecutive terms. You get to run. I mean, you can run and if you win. Hey, you got eight years. You got eight years in the, in the White House. And then after those eight years, hey, you got to come off. You got to come off the pot. The thing I don't understand is 
why is the president held to two consecutive terms and yet those that are in the Senate and those in the House are limitless? I mean, they can stay, they can run until they cannot run. I mean, they can run, run for their run for their seat, win and still serve in Congress in 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 tandem, actually. So why is this bothering me? It's bothering me because, again, when you have that stagnant um, on both sides, not just Democrats and Republicans. I mean, I mean, it's on both sides, Democrats, and Republicans. I still think that, you know, if you serve in the Senate, it should honestly be like the presidency. And this is, I'm just being honest, it's just like the presidency. I believe the presidency's two term, two consecutive term limit should be the same for the Senate as well as the House. Why? Because it's going to force these politicians to work. They realize they have a limited time window of things they can get done. And I think that's the problem. One of the many problems in Congress is that, well, senators and representatives are way too comfortable. As long as they do just it's like it's like for most jobs, let's be honest. For most jobs, we are just simply doing the minimum. We are doing the we're doing the bare minimum. We really are. Because a lot of us older have realized if you work hard, <laughs> if you work hard at a job that doesn't respect you, you're gonna get more work. But if you do less work or if you're lazy, then you're just gonna get fired. But if you do just the just the bare minimum, you're good. They can't expect more out of you, but they don't expect to be lazy. But if you do just enough to reach that bare minimum, you hit that sweet spot. And again, that's why I sit there and say for most of the senators and representatives, for a lot of them, I know a lot more. I know a lot of them really go above and beyond. Cory Bush being one of them. I can't I can't stress that enough between Cory Bush and Ileana Omar, Alejandro Cortez, um, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, uh, I can keep going down the line of those who have who have really went above and beyond. But for a lot of those Senate Democrats in there, they do. And a lot of the House and a lot of the Democratic uh, Democrats in the House, they do the bare minimum. Except when it comes to election time. Oh, election time, they're out there promising, saying, oh, we're going to do this. We're going to tackle this. We're going to do this. And they do just enough because let's be honest, the alternative isn't any better. And guess what? Another another term in Congress. Another, I think they get paid one forty. I think it was what what 140, 150,000 a year, something like of that nature. Um, salary for another term is confirmed. But again, that's the part that always bugs me. It's just that why are we not setting term limits on who is serving? If they're serving the people, you don't get to serve until you decide that one day you want to quit. It's like you want to serve this term. Once the term once the term is up, you can run for it again. And then if you win again, then after that, that's it. It should be like two terms. You cannot run. You can only run two consecutive terms at a time, which means you have to sit out one term. I think if we I think we as a people, if we started doing that, we would have a different Congress. That's just me. But again, Pelosi, the reason why I say that is because I don't think Pelosi and the rest of the old guard, because the rest of the old guard Democrats, they don't want to do really anything progressive. It took it, I mean, it took a handful of Democrats to get Pelosi to talk about, you know, pushing student loan debt. And even she wasn't the and, and she wasn't the one leading the charge on it. It was the progressive Democrats that were. So it's like it's almost on the lines of what is actually Pelosi standing for? Because quite frankly, we don't know her. We don't know her podium. It seems she reacts to everything out there, but there's not something that she's pushing for herself. So again, this is why I sit there and say the old guard, the old guard of Democrats and Republicans needs to be put on a term, same way the president is. That's all I'm saying. But move right along, guys. Speaking of the House, they did move forward uh, with Mark Meadows because just like Steve Bannon, um, he is being held in contempt. Hill at this hour and the House vote on whether to recommend former President Trump's chief of staff, Mark Meadows, be held in contempt of Congress for refusing to comply with a subpoena from the committee investigating the January 6th attack. Meadows earlier had turned over documents included in them text messages from Donald Trump Jr., from Republican lawmakers, and from several Fox News hosts, all urging Meadows to tell the president to do something to stop the attack on the Capitol. Here's our chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl, tonight. 
Uh, tonight, in the very chamber that came under attack nearly one year ago, a vote on holding former President Trump's chief of staff and former member of Congress, Mark Meadows, in criminal contempt for refusing to fully cooperate with the January 6th investigation. Mr. Meadows is in contempt. He must testify, and I urge my colleagues to vote yes. Before he refused to testify, Meadows had turned over some 9,000 documents from his personal cell phones to the committee, including urgent text messages from people close to Trump imploring Meadows to get the president to say something to stop the violence. For 187 minutes, President Trump refused to act. Let's let that sink in, Madam Speaker. He refused to act. When action by our president was required, it was essential, and it was compelled by his oath to our Constitution. One of those text messages came from Trump's own son, Donald Trump Jr. Hours before the riot, he and Meadows were laughing it up at the rally outside the White House. An actual fighter, one of the few, a real fighter. Thank you, Mark. As the violence unfolded, the president's son sent Meadows a series of frantic texts. He's got to condemn this ASAP. The Capitol Police tweet is not enough, Donald Trump Jr. texted. Meadows responded, quote, I'm pushing it hard, I agree. Still, President Trump did not immediately act. Donald Trump Jr. texted again and again, urging action by the president, quote, we need an Oval Office address. He has to lead now. It has gone too far and gotten out of hand. Republican lawmakers also texted Meadows as the Capitol was under attack and Trump was out of sight. It is really bad up here on the Hill. Another one, the president needs to stop this ASAP. Another one, fix this now. There were even some pleas from Trump's allies on Fox News would later go on to downplay the events of that day. It wasn't an insurrection. But on January 6th, a very different message from Laura Ingram, texting Meadows, quote, the president needs to tell people in the Capitol to go home. This is hurting all of us. He is destroying his legacy. Sean Hannity texted, quote, can he make a statement, ask people to leave the Capitol? Meadows is now saying he won't talk to the committee because Trump has asked him to keep everything confidential. But on the same day Meadows announced he wouldn't testify, he published a book on his experiences in the White House. If found guilty of criminal contempt, Meadows could face up to a year in prison, but the decision on whether to prosecute him is up to the Justice Department, not up to Congress, and there is no indication yet whether or not DOJ will go forward with that, David. Man, if you ever, <laughs> here's my thing. The one that I keep saying about this, and I still find it funny, that this is literally like watching Goodfellas. It's almost like, first and foremost, Trump does not have executive privilege. He's not. He's a private. He's a he's a private citizen now. He's no longer president. Executive privilege does not apply. So, with the committee investigating the the January six failed coup d'état by white by white supremacists, because that's what we're going to call them. Um, Mark Meadows is literally at the center of it because not only is not only were he, not only were Fox uh, so-called Fox News people um, texting him, but also the fact that Don Jr. is texting him talking about, well, we need to get ahead of this, we need to do this, and you've seen the text message now. So again, this just goes to show you the reason why they want to investigate this so bad because there is so much smoke around all of this. Which only goes to show you that either they go show you that Trump didn't do anything because again, I've said this before many times on this podcast. He loves the idea of romantic. Uh, rom he romanticized the idea of being a dictator. He romanticized the idea of being a dictator. He loves to be revered. He loves to be the center of attention. And why are we not surprised? Because again, the uh, his white supremacist buddies raided the Capitol, and now it's like, well, why don't they need, he needs to say something, he needs to do something, and then he's like, he's quiet. So, of course, uh, Meadows is going to sit there and say, well, on behalf of the former president, I'm not going to say anything. You don't have executive privilege, sir, and pleading the fifth, this makes you look guilty, but, oh, that's right, you have a book coming out. 
So because you have a book coming out, you're like, oh, I don't need to really say anything, but you can buy my book, you know. And again, it just it just goes to show you the lack of what this administration, the lack of the lack of uh, besides professional with this administration that really along with them and Fox News, it's like everybody should be implemented. It really should be. At the same time, it's like, yes, the Department of Justice should pursue this because what is the whole point of having contempt? I know as a regular person, if a judge holds me in contempt, I can be in jail. I have to pay a fine. I have to pay a fine. But if these people are in contempt of char, of contempt of not of failing to failing to uh, respond to a subpoena and actually be in court, then by all means, throw the book at them. Show you know, really show them by example that these are just not simply platitudes. So it's like, hey. This comes with consequences, but we all know how Trump and consequences actually work, so we shouldn't be surprised. Um, but moving right along, guys, I did want to cover this story as well. Uh, Supreme conservatives are, and again, this is why I stand to say I am so very scared about having a conservative-leaning Supreme Court because the, literally this is a story out of Maine where tax dollars for religious school tuition. And again, this is actually out of a Supreme Court case. The two failures from Maine asked the Supreme Court to expand taxpayer support for religious schools by requiring a state tuition assistance program to include secretarian as well as non-secretary uh, non -secretary institutions. So to be honest with you, so um, to really cut down to the muscle on this, guys, private schools like religious schools get no, no federal funding at all. Because basically, federal funding is not meant to basically uh, push religious religious schools or those that are pushing religious ideals. That's why a lot of the schools out there that you know, like uh, your Catholic schools, your Christian schools, or you know, schools of the faith, or however they call themselves, if they're a religious school. They are not receiving any federal funding because, again, um, how federal funding works is supposed to be for public schools. Public schools are non-sectarian or just non-religious schools, to be to be very short. Um, however, families are wanting their families in Maine are wanting to send their kids uh, to these schools in order to do so. They want to be able to get the federal funding, uh, a la scholarships, to in order to send them there. And again, that's crazy because the attorney, quote unquote, says religious discrimination is religious discrimination. Religious schools, after all, teach religion just as a soccer team plays soccer and a book club reads books. It's only because of religion they are excluded. Yes. <laughs> I mean, the analogy itself is, well, stupid because, again, this is a, it's also the big thing I have. It's like for my future children, they won't go to religion. They won't go to schools. They won't go to religious schools because, again, there's a reason why church and state are separated. You know, if I'm sending my kids off to a very nice private school or a charter school that I'm paying tuition for, religion better not be one of the subjects. They can get the religion at home or they can get the religion from church. They do not get the need to get the religion from school. That's why for a lot of these public schools, woefully underfunded as they are, especially across the U.S., should not have to share their funding with private religious schools. Hence the word private. Private means that parents are paying for the tuition of their children. And I understand that child, I understand that tuition for these private schools is definitely um is definitely not <laughs> it's up it's up there from what I've been told. But again, it's like if you want your child to go to a, if you want your child to go to a private religious institution, knock yourself out, pay the toll. But Quit asking the state to expand it because, again, it's separation of church and state. A private religious school cannot get tuition. It's just that simple. Um, especially in Maine, where uh, they said they said they said the story about out of one hundred and eighty thousand school children in Maine, only five thousand uh, attend private schools using tuition aid. So five thousand out of one hundred eighty thousand kids in Maine, five thousand attend tuition. Five thousand attend private schools with tuition. But none of that tuition goes to religious schools, which is why I am scared because in that article, the Supreme Court is starting to look at that. Now, again, the use, and this is the reason why I keep pointing this out, where with the Supreme Court, this conservative leaning Supreme Court, this is why I say I'm concerned. Because right now they are un they are really giving a lot of leeway to 
let's be honest, religious-based in the religious-based uh, items and things of that nature. For example, I like going back to abortion. It is, you know, for most religions, they you know most religions they don't they frown upon abortion. You know, of course, this world, of course, our country isn't founded by religion, but unfortunately, we have enough people out there that believe that it is and believe that we should all be one nation under God, which again is not what the founding fathers had intended. So. And keep in mind, they're also slave owners. So again, it's it's amazing to me that the Supreme Court is considering this to where they may expand it. And if they expand it, that just takes more away from public schools, which are already woefully underfunded. I cannot make that up. Um, but moving right along, guys, I did want to cover this other story. Again, I covered the Kellogg story just because, again, um, they are still on that strike. I know I said last week, uh, especially last this past Saturday in my, in my weekend review, that Kellogg's decided that to come back to the negotiation table and say, hey, we understand that you guys are having issues, but here's what we want to do. We want to give you a 3% raise across the board. That cool? Of course, that raise was rejected. And then Kellogg said, well, fine, we are going to just replace our 1400. We're going to replace our 1400 workers who are on strike with non-union workers. Well, that also didn't go over well, as everybody is as uh, everybody from the Nebraska governor to the president are all basically letting Coke Kellogg's know, hey, you need to fix this issue very quickly, because, again, um, Kellogg's right now is that if you if you haven't noticed, on especially on Facebook, there is a crap load of boycotts out there about Kellogg's. I mean, you know, Frosted Flakes, Pop Tarts, anything Kellogg made is being boycotted on, and eventually that is going to cut into their profits. And reason being because Kellogg has had some um, have pushed the most unsafest, unhealthiest things on workers. I'm talking 16 hour shifts. Uh, seven days a week, no time off, uh, health insurance was cut back. And on top of that, you know, your pay hasn't been increased. So of course the workers are going to quit, understandably so. And now Kellogg CEO is like, well, we're going to try to work this out. And I keep telling you guys, this is the reason why you should always, always have a union. And if you're not a part of a union, find one because unions do work. Unions will hold these corporations accountable and Kellogg's will see the light eventually because eventually the one the, the way you get a corporation's attention is that you hit that you hit their bottom line. Corporations pay attention once you start hitting their money and trust me they're not too far off from doing that. But we will follow that story as it comes along as Kellogg's has vowed to resolve this before Christmas before uh before uh, Christmas Eve, but we will see. Um but to the workers out there stay strong because again I've said it before, unions work. Now, uh, also moving right along, guys, I did want to cover this story. Um, if you haven't noticed that this uh, couple of days ago, especially uh, in the Midwest and the South, we had some severe weather that had several tornadoes that had tore through multiple states, and especially uh, one, of the, one of the more hard-hit areas, Kentucky. And, of course, lives were lost and people are still being recovered as, as now the search and rescue has now became recovery. Um, but we still hope for everybody and their families that are being taken care of. That being said, guys, there is a story that did come out of Kentucky that I did post on my Facebook that I just cannot look away um, because basically at a candle at a candlestick factory in Kentucky, the workers were basically threatened to be fired if they left because of the tornado. I wish I could make this up. Now to the tornadoes that have hit six states as we learn new details here at NBC News about a candle factory in Mayfield that had more than 100 people in it. You heard from one of those survivors, one of those factory workers earlier in the show. Well, now NBC News is learning that employees, some of them say supervisors threatened to fire them if they left their shifts early because of the tornado warnings. Now, the company, we should note, is totally denying those allegations. They say it is absolutely untrue that the employees would not be able to leave. Dion Hampton broke that story for NBCNews.com. Dion is joining us now. Dion, I understand you're, you pop back to your hotel room. You're going to get back out in the field later on tonight. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about, about how employees walked you through what happened on Friday as a storm was coming in. What did they tell you? How did they try to stay safe? Sure. So I just broke a national exclusive um, less than an hour ago. Uh, this story stems out of me going up to one of the shelters that was housing a lot of the people who had lost all their worldly possessions, who didn't have any power electricity. You know, the city doesn't have any power electricity. And I talked to a guy there while I was interviewing him. He told me that he was an employee of the 
of the candy factory and that while he was there, you know, before the tornado came, a lot of people there had wished that they would have been able to leave and go home to take shelter there with their loved ones or somewhere else that was safe, but they weren't allowed to because if they did, they risked losing their jobs. So I followed up and I've spoken to five people who all give me the same story. And the story is, is what? That when those sirens hit, they tried to leave and they were told you might be fired if you do? That's what they're sort of saying, these employees? Correct. Initially, the company wanted, uh, as the first sirens went off, the first sirens went off, I'm going to say around between 5, 30, 6 o'clock, and they wanted everybody to like maybe take shelter in the bathrooms and the hallways. But then there was a three-hour window between then and when the second siren had came. And that's what a lot of the um, a lot of the employees there had asked to go home. So we're talking 15 employees, that's on the vote in, possibly up to 40, but I'll just call it 15 for now. But who had asked, listen, it's getting dangerous outside. We're worried for our lives. Can we go home? And they said, well, yes, but if you do, you know, don't bother coming back. Wow. Now, I have to say, we said it right at the top, Regina, companies saying, uh-uh. The company's saying this did not happen, right? Correct. So I, I spoke to the company spokesman earlier today, and he said that ever since COVID started, that they have a policy where you actually are allowed to leave at any point during your work shift, you can leave and decide to come back the next day. So that means if you want to stay there for 45 minutes, okay. If you want to stay there for two hours, okay. If you want to stay there for the whole shift, okay. So they're denying the allegations, but the employees are the, the employees are sticking by their story. And some of them I know are still in the hospital. Yeah, I mean, one of the women who I spoke to was literally two o'clock this morning, and she was talking to me from her hospital bed. Wow. She sustained a lot of um, burns. She was trapped under a concrete wall for six hours, and we started talking on the phone, and this is how much of an important issue this was to her, but she didn't even bother going to sleep because she was saying, listen, Dion, this is what, this was, this is what the work conditions were like when we were inside the candy fa inside the uh, camera factory. Dion Hampton, you said... I mean... Here's my thing: is first and foremost that is ew. again, it's it's messed up. It's messed up for the simple fact of the matter. It's just that imagine that if you've never been in severe weather, and trust me, take it from somebody who's seen tornadoes up and cl up close, um, and the and the weather conditions that get that change when that sun is coming down the road. Again, that's not a laughing matter, but also at the same time, it shouldn't be. Hey, boss, we look, if it was me, and I'm going to be honest with you because I've been in that situation before, had it been me, and I know that, you know, hey, we got severe weather coming our way, um, boss, look, bump what you're talking about. I'm out. Oh, well, if you well, if you leave, don't bother come back. Cool. Peace. Here's my thing. And, again, I understand with the way jobs are, Folks can't, I mean, if you have bills, children, things of that nature, you have to consider a lot before you just tell a job, you know, you know, you could take this job and shove it. I get that. But I point this out because if the workers are sitting there saying they were told if they leave, they're fired. And the company's saying, well, that's not true. Who would you believe? Because for me, I'm like, I look at it from a logical standpoint. Why would the workers need to lie? Why would the workers need to lie about saying, well, if we leave, if we leave, and they told us if we leave, we get fired? Where, where's the, here's my thing. Number one, where is the benefit if it's a lie? I, that's why I said it's a little hard to believe that, you know, companies and of course, and so, and keep again, is it not so far fetched? Did we not just do a podcast on Amazon drivers? On Amazon drivers and UPS drivers about a year ago, where Amazon drivers were pretty much told, hey, this algorithm is what you go by. You can't, you know, you're, you're supposed to take breaks. You're supposed to take breaks, but Amazon drivers know they can't. You're supposed to take a 30-minute lunch. Amazon drivers know they can't. They also they also have to, you know, find other ways of relieving themselves when on these delivery trips because a bathroom is not always available. And we covered that. And what did Amazon say? Well, you know, the drivers are given adequate time to to basically take two 10-minute breaks and take a lunch while delivering packages. We all know that's BS. And the company tried to hide it up. UPS drivers were driving around uh, during the summertime um, trying to deliver packages, and almost one guy almost died from almost died from heat stroke. What do UPS say? Well, we tell our drivers to keep the doors open and try to keep it in. Keep in mind, though, those uh, vehicles they drive 
are not air conditioned. They're not air conditioned, those vehicles. Those vehicles do not have heat for the winter time. And yet they are, and yet they are told to deliver packages. So if we already know that two billion dollar companies out there, two billion dollar companies, because they reap billions in profits every year. Why is it so far-fetched to believe that the workers there out of those companies who have the same issues as a candlestick making factory in Kentucky, where again, workers just simply wanted to go home because they would feel better, safer in their own homes than they would in the factory. But those in the factory sat there and told those workers, if you go home, you get fired. I'm sorry. It's not, to me, it's not a lie. It's not a lie because I see no benefit. I see no benefit to where what they gain from that. Because why else would they still be in a factory when a tornado is bearing down on them? Because they have to keep their jobs. Because money is because money is hard to come by, and jobs are and good jobs. I don't say just any jobs. Good jobs. There's there's ten million crappy jobs out there currently, but good jobs. Those are hard. Those are few, far and in between. And I'm sorry with the workers. If I was them, and it's come to find out that they, that somebody in the company did tell them tell them that, and they're able to prove that, then honestly, that company that owns that factory is 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 held liable for criminal negligence and manslaughter. If I was if I was if I was a prosecutor, that would be the first two charges I come up with. Because again, who, how in the world can you sit there and say in the middle of a thunderstorm, in the middle of a severe storm event like that, and say, if you leave, you will be fired? Because like I said, had it been me, no job is worth your life. I'll be the first person to tell you there's no such thing as corporate loyalty, and no job is worth your life. So we'll follow that story as it comes along. I think more is going to come from that. But again, it's like I keep saying. I don't I don't see why they I don't see I don't see why they believe workers had to lie. I think it's the God honest truth and I think it's going to come out. But again, we'll follow that story as it comes along. Another story I want to cover, guys, because we did talk about the Omicron variant, that it's out there and it's real and it's still putting people in the hospital. And yes, it's unvaccinated folks. This is the COVID war at Sparrow Hospital in Lansing, Michigan, once again, overrun with cases. Kathy is worried about both herself and her family. Was your entire family hospitalized at one point? You, your husband, and your daughter? Yeah. In fact, my daughter's still in. And she's real bad. The hospital says 82% of current COVID patients are unvaccinated. Kathy is one of them. I was so conflicted for quite a while. And anyway, um, just... Uh, was a bad, bad choice on my part. The hospital is at 100% capacity. They've stopped inpatient elective surgeries. The nurses are stretched thin. They've had to bring in 200 extra workers. I have definitely second guessed working on the COVID floor and working in the hospital is so draining and so difficult. Um, I honestly have dread coming to work. But then I get here and I see the patients and they're so sick and they need so much help. But as soon as I get here, you know, I'm, I love it because I I became a nurse to help people. And I kind of pushed my own emotion to the side. The stories frustratingly familiar to when the pandemic first hit. Doctors and nurses we spoke to are seeing more COVID patients from neighboring rural counties where the vaccination rate is lower than the state's average. It's become a battle against misinformation. So you've had patients refusing treatments that you offer here who don't want to get vaccinated, but then asking for other unproven stuff they've read about on the internet. Yes, especially this go around, um, the ivermectin, a lot of like herbs and things that I don't even know what they are, but none of them have been, to my knowledge, shown to improve the outcomes of somebody with COVID. Sparrow Hospital saying they're seeing their worst surge with more than 150 patients currently hospitalized. The hospital CEO giving a warning he never thought he would have to give again. If we don't get the vaccination rate up, the social distancing, wearing the mask, and the booster, it is going to be a very, very long winter. Patients like Kathy now left with regrets and the hope her family recovers. Don't make the same mistake I did. You get in there and you get that vaccine. Please do not wait. That is so important. This stuff is catching you really, really bad. So whatever you're contemplating, yes, no, indifferent, whatever, 
don't decide like that. Just go do it. So important. Because you could lose your loved ones. So literally and figuratively, I play that video because, again, it's always the unvaccinated. And I keep pointing this out just because I don't know what else I could do. <laughs> uh, and I, I don't mean this. I don't mean this as in a joking manner, but I mean this in the simple fact of the matter is just that, you know, when you're unvaccinated, this is what happens. This is what happens. And I'm like, what more is it going to take for a lot of people out there who are unvaccinated to finally get it? Because I think the simple fact of the matter is that they won't get it. I think the simple fact of the matter is that they're just going to sit there and say, well, it will never happen to me. Well, yeah, it's like it can happen to you. It, it, uh, I keep saying about COVID and its multiple variants, you have a better chance of surviving it if you're unvaccinated. And as you can see from the lady that was just on the Excuse me, the lady that was just literally showing the video, uh, I wish I didn't hesitate. Her and her entire family are battling it. I hope they pull through. But I, like I said before, I'll say it once and I'll say it again. I have yet to see anybody who has dealt with COVID and at the end of it all sat there and said, you know what? I'm still not getting the vaccine. Every time I've seen a person get COVID, it's like every time I've seen a person get COVID and survive it, it's like a baptized Christian. I have seen the light. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, friends and family, get that vaccine, get the booster. You're going to save yourself a world of hurt. And I'm just saying, it's never, obviously, like I, I say this all the time on podcasts, you show me one, show me one case where a person got COVID, beat it, and still said they're not getting the vaccine. But they'll turn around and take ivermectin and all this other crazy stuff. I'm just saying. Get the vaccine. It's just that simple. It's really and truly that simple. Uh, but moving right along in stories, guys, and this is a story I did cover about uh, a, a year ago. Remember a lady in Chicago that got woken up by a police raid and she was literally handcuffed naked and just, I mean, naked because she was just going down for bed. Police raid, the police raid her house on act, police raid the wrong house, which is her house, woke her up, guns pointed handcuffed her she's naked and she's freaking out because again cops have raided her home for uh trying to find a suspect got the wrong home handcuffed her and she's trying to explain while while panicked while naked and really just pissed well it seems that a settlement was actually reached with said what was said woman and chicago police department chicago police officers raided anjanette young's home in february 2019 she was restrained while getting ready for bed and was forced to stand handcuffed and naked as officers searched her residence. It turned out to be the wrong home. Today, Celia Mesa, the city's corporation counsel, on why the city is agreeing to a $2.9 million settlement. She was left in a complete state of undress for 16 seconds after the officers entered. And that it took a full 10 minutes until she was allowed to get fully dressed. Mesa suggests if the case went to trial, a jury might award Young up to $16 million for each second she was completely undressed. We all saw um, the way in which she was treated. At one point, the city requested sanctions against Young for sharing the video of the raid. But then the city backed off saying they only wanted to sanction Young's attorney. The Finance Committee unanimously agreed to the settlement after some debate. I believe that we owed her more for the horrible way in which she was treated that day. Mayor Lightfoot has personally... Oh, sorry about that. I'm um, not sure what happened, but all right. Um, so I apologize, guys. I'm not sure what happened in the middle of that. <laughs> I want to say that, you know, part of the video may have conked out. Again, 
Apologies. Sorry about that. So for all those, so the video when it cocked out, the woman that they were talking about, again, was the woman in Chicago where they basically raided her home. She was naked. They handcuffed her and she was embarrassed. And, you know, think about that. You're naked, you're handcuffed, and police are trying to ask you questions. And she, and you're like, can I go put some clothes on? I'm sitting here freaking naked in front of you guys. And Needless to say, uh, with that being said, uh, what they did announce, and like I said, I don't know when the video cut out, so I apologize for that. But they did settle a two. They did have a settlement of two point nine million. Um, reason being because if the case had went to court, she could have gotten more. And of course, Mayor Lori Lightfoot did apologize and said, "I'm glad that we can get this issue resolved." Yeah, but it's not. I mean, here's the thing. I know from an optic standpoint, the city of Chicago has egg on its face. But if I was her and her attorney, I would have took to court. I would have sat there and put it out there for the world to see. I would have sat there and said, well, somewhere along these lines, somebody somebody had to pay for this. Somebody um, was going to have to answer for this. That's just the whole thing. And it's amazing to me that, yes, she did accept the $2.9 million settlement. But at the same time, it's like, but the one thing that still got away with is that none of those officers in the raid were were punished, were reprimanded. The sergeant who actually signed off on the raid um, definitely wasn't reprimanded or no punishment was given to him. So it's kind of like saying, oh, we're sorry. Here's money. Please don't please don't drag this out. Keep in mind. They wanted to go after her because she released that footage, not because of the fact the police reset the police reset footage. Let's be honest. When it comes to law enforcement, they know they messed up. They are not going to release body cam footage first. It was the fact that her and her attorney released that to the press. And I keep saying this. I keep saying this. Whenever there's a monumental change that should have happened from Jump Street, it's always because the other side had to leak it to the public in order to in order to understand, in order to let people know that, yes, this actually happened. And at the same time with that woman, yeah, 2.9. And I agree with the ultimate in that video. She should have gotten way more. At the same time, there should have been some infractions among the Chicago Police Department, mainly with the sergeant that signed off on that raid and the officers that were involved. Because again, enough, it wasn't enough. It wasn't. I know a lot of people saying, but she got 2.9 million. It's not enough. Because again, money doesn't, money doesn't give you back. Didn't get the money, 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 money. I don't know why the word money is so hard to say right now. Money doesn't give you back dignity. And her dignity was taken from her that evening. And again, those officers are still out there protecting and serving and not facing punishment. But, you know, they consider it resolved because she accepted the settlement. Had it been me, I took them to court. I would roll the dice. I would have made sure that to put the Chicago Police Department on blast and Mary and Mary Lightfoot's office for that, you know, for lack of better words, half-assed apology. Just saying. Um, but speaking of things that are crazy and the reason why I get worried about public schools every day, another teacher... <sighs> Another teacher, another student caught caught because it got caught. And there's just, there's no words for this. Lots of words in English class that you could write about why this is not right. Polk County Sheriff Brady Judd tells News Channel 8, 20-year-old Ayanna Davis laid it out in plain English. She had sex several times with a teenage student. I want to ask her, come on, girl, what are you thinking? You're a teacher. You're in a position of supervision over this student. And you're having sex with him? Her arrest affidavit shows David started as a substitute English teacher at Lakeland High School in August. A student notified officers after seeing a Snapchat video of Davis having sex with a student. Davis admitted to having sex with the teenager several times at both their homes from October to December, according to her affidavit. He's still a juvenile a child and she's an adult and she had sex and it's wrong on every level. The staffing service company Kelly Education hired Davis in August. A spokesperson said she passed all the background and screening requirements. Polk County Public Schools changed its rules in October to allow anyone 20 years old or older with a high school or GED degree to work as a substitute teacher. Aid on Your Side has been told Davis began her work before that change. But Kelly Education did not disclose her certification level.
this is the part where I have to sit there and I got to ask questions. I have to ask questions so much because number one, that another teacher got caught having sex with a student. However, this this is the I don't mean to be petty, but it's like <laughs> I, I, I need to get this out of my system before I say it. Like, I'm not going to lie. A part of me is a little envious of these kids. And I know that's not the most proper thing to say. But from a guy's standpoint, it's like, where the crap were these teachers when I was going to school? OK, I said it. Got out of my system. Cool. Now, the other part of it all is like it's like they were it's like someone had told and they sat there and said a student at the school reported to school resource officers the existence of a video on Snapchat. Somebody snitched. Probably somebody who didn't get a chance to hit the teacher, too. <laughs> That's wrong. That's wrong, but I'm probably not wrong. But again, um, all jokes aside, it's one of those things where, again, it's it's you wonder about these teachers. And I know a lot of parents are now concerned because these teachers are in here messing with these students. And no matter how you look at it, at all jokes and, and schoolboy fantasies aside, it's it's vulgar. It's terrible that we trust these educators, that we trust some of these educators. And again, it's in Florida and Florida did loosen their law. Keep in mind, guys, Florida's having a teacher shortage. So they did loosen their law about, you know, certain uh, certain guides, certain education and uh, benefits that's needed to basically be a substitute teacher in Florida. And that person just had to be under the fog. Now, again, it is, there's no other way to say this, but simple fact of the matter, it's just that, well, it's it's sickening, it's disgusting, and yes, she should be prosecuted because um, we see the same thing with guys as well. I mean, male teachers and male teachers are the same thing, and we say that they're predators, and they and women in that same part are just as much as predators as well. Um, but I do got to admit, the fact that half these kids are getting found out is because they're on social media and because somebody's snitching because they probably didn't get done. But that's just me. But again terrible shouldn't have happened and honestly it's just like who knows how many stories out there are just like that but move right along guys speaking of teachers um this is probably one for bad optics and i do mean bad optics because um you ever heard of good intentions yeah this one got missed horribly horribly wrong Sioux Falls Stampede are known for hosting charitable initiatives during their games. Saturday night's Dash for Cash is being heavily criticized all across the internet, on Twitter, on Facebook, and from news organizations. The event featured a pile of $5,001 bills donated by CU Mortgage Direct, a Sioux Falls lender. That money was dumped out on a rug at center ice, with hockey fans cheering on the competition as teachers raced to grab all the cash that they could. South Dakota rep Aaron Healy says the optics aren't good. I know that this was a private organization donating money to teachers. I think it was a well-intentioned event, but teachers should never have to grapple for money that's needed for classroom improvements. Healy says the whole thing opens up a larger conversation about teacher pay in South Dakota. It really just shows how truly broken our system is. Events like this aren't really going to solve our funding problem. On average, teachers are spending $750 out of their own pockets to give their students the supplies they need to learn. In her recent budget address, Governor Christy Nome proposed a 6% raise for educators in the state. Still, South Dakota ranks near the bottom for teacher salary in the United States. We have a statewide educator shortage, um, teacher shortage, and uh, I, don't, I don't know if there's a district in the state that isn't looking for a position or a bunch of positions. So I think if we can consistently um, give an increase to education over the next few years, um, especially if it's above the rate of inflation, then we could be in a better position. Uh, but that's going to take a lot of effort uh, when we go to pair this, this session in, in January. Ultimately, it all goes back to how South Dakota values education. Dash for Cash is one of those teachable moments. Uh, we can do better for our students by making sure their teachers have the supplies their students need. I mean, yeah. I mean, aside from the fact of having a whole bunch of teachers uh, wear oversized shirts and collect dollars into their shirts um, on a carpeted area during a hockey game, um, yeah, we could do a lot better. Um, there's no other way to say this. It, it, it's just bad all around. And again, there's other ways that could have been handled. You could have just gave them a check. You could have just gave them all separate checks. 
You could have gave him checks. You see the point I'm trying to make here? You could have gave him checks. And it would have been great. Uh, like I said, it's all about, and yes, it's all about good intentions. But again, you could have gave him a check. Uh, the simple fact of the matter is, that, like I said, educators hold a special place in my heart anyway. They are, that is the most um, under, under mind. I won't say under mind. That's terrible. That's a terrible word. I'm having so many problems with word this evening. Honestly, it's the most overlooked professions out there. I don't think educators get paid enough. I don't think they get the funding that they need. It's just like public schools. I don't think schools get the funding that they need. Educators do not get the fund, do not get the, the, the facilities, the uh, available resources, aside from money, aside from salary increases. They simply do not get it. And over, especially in public school systems where it's overcrowded, where uh, students are on top of each other, learning issues and just multiple, multiple issues in a school. I keep saying this all, all the time. Educators are woefully underpaid and underfunded and yet are being are yet are trying to make miracles in the classroom every day. I have said it all the time. But that also being said, it does shine a light on this. I keep on saying that teachers teachers should get paid more. Schools should get more cut of the funding. And I keep saying the only way we can do that is to really tax the rich and cut back our military. Give that same give the same money we give the military. Give that same money to the Department of Education. Let's actually invest in our students and not in the military and see if we have less wars but more smart people. Just saying. That's all I'm saying. But with that being said, guys, we're going to go ahead and move on to our feel-good segment because usually on how the fact we got here, we usually cover a lot of things that are doom and gloom sometimes. Uh, just make you want to lose your faith in humanity. But, hey, it's hump day. Tomorrow's Friday, which is Thursday. We want to leave you guys on a good note. You know, put some spray in your step, a song in, a song in your heart, and a smile on your face. And I try to do so by explore, try to do so by trying to find great stories that kind of inspire or at least you with a smile on your face. This one again is about a waitress that got a very nice tip, and I cannot blame her at all. Inside the Silver Diner, Marylanders are sipping their cups of coffee. Or for some, hot chocolate with extra whip. We look forward to coming here. The wait staff is great. Thank you. That includes Roxana Salinas. Do you want some coffee? Last week, she received an early Christmas present, a tip unheard of for a $25 check. They put on the sign and said, we're going to give you an extra tip. And I saw all the cash, the hundreds, twenties, ten. And I say, are you sure this for me? I say, yes. $910. They get up and hug me and they were crying with me. They say, oh, Roxana, you make us cry. I say, I'm sorry, but this is so beautiful, you know. The stocking stuffer came from a group of do-gooders wanting to make someone's day brighter. It's like God, you know, send me that gift special to me, you know. It's like appreciation, you know, of life. Customers here say it couldn't have gone to a better server. She's so giving and we just love to see her. She brightens our day when we come in. If I can see you, Merry Christmas, okay? Ben, yes, I see him pretty, pretty, pretty much pretty much every day. Good. <laughs> the Secret Santa has told Salinas they're not done giving. They're planning to strike again somewhere this holiday season. Those people are angels and just not for me, for somebody else as well in Elkridge Tommy Clark and I just like I said I thought that was pretty cool just because again you're very hard pressed to find individuals that will literally go above and beyond and I keep saying this all the time I will never not stop saying this because you know if you can basically make somebody's life great whether it's a day an hour uh uh or a lifetime do so the world could use more random acts of kindness. And of course, with Secret Santa's out there, you never know. Secret Santa's be popping up everywhere, especially for that young for that young lady uh, getting a $910 tip. Awesome. I mean, there was also another woman that received a very nice tip. But of course, that story is not really a feel good moment because of you know what happened to her. But we'll cover that another day. But again... I just thought it was cool that a group of people decided they wanted to change a person's life and do something good for them because I still believe out there, we call it karma, call it intuition, call it the golden rule, if you will. Uh, whatever you do out there in the world will come back to you twofold, good or bad. So always try to, you know, try to treat people right and, you know, try to not be as petty sometimes. That being said, guys, that's going to do it for this podcast. I just want to thank everybody that liked, that shared, that commented, that let me, that let other people know that we're live. I certainly appreciate it. Sorry about the, sorry about the late start time, guys, but hey, 
things happen. But again, thank you all for watching. Before I do that, here's some shameless plugging I must do. I want to first talk about my buddy uh, who's currently on a um, – he's currently his – he is a, his uh, – Holiday hiatus, if you will. My buddy Big BZA Dot, you can find him at the bottom of on Facebook, Big BZA Dot on socials. He usually has some shows, but he's probably doing some best ofs and repeats. Uh, Smoking Trailer Sundays every Sunday from 6 30 to 9 p.m., which is basically movies and video game trailers that he likes to show that he finds interesting and therefore you might find interesting. And also the RAF, which is like America's Funny Song Bills, except done by World Star, only for the grown intended every Tuesday from 6 30 to 9 p.m. Um, anything new that he actually does will usually be on his Facebook page or on his. Uh, Instagram page, which you can both you can both check out, like and share and follow. A the Bond Westman on Facebook or Big Busy A Dot on all socials. Um, now, with also that being said, I do want to shout out another group of guys um, that allowed me to share their podcast on. Let me share my podcast on their page. Let's try that again. Uh, my buddies over at Ari and Geek present Geek Salad. Of course, you can find them on Facebook and YouTube. This is actually their YouTube page is showing right now called Geek Salad. Um, they are a couple of podcasting brethren I met this year. Um, that really talk about all the things of pop culture that talk about uh, all things nerdy and nerdy and geek and sci-fi as today uh, Ari has said that they're going to revoke his black card because he has not yet seen Lovecraft Country. That's probably something Ari I would have kept to myself, but hey, you're a Snyder fan. You're going to be, you're going to be bold with no matter what you get. But anyway, great group of guys. Honestly, love talking to them. Hopefully, I'll have them back on my other podcast, Get Bit, very soon. But definitely check them out, Ari and Geek present Geek Salad on Facebook and on YouTube. Now, as for yours truly, guys, link that is scrolling at the bottom. If you're able to copy and paste that in your browser, we'll take you to my link tree that has the Facebook and YouTube groups for all of my podcasts, How the Frack We Got Here, Get Bit, and of course, uh, um, How the Frack We Got Here, as you're currently watching right now. <laughs> Uh, as you're currently watching right now. Um, of course, you can like, share on all those as every podcast that I do. Um, we'll be there for your viewing pleasure. And I just found out that I can actually do audio only podcasts. So we will always, so we will also be doing audio podcasts to wherever audio podcasts can be heard. Um, so I can't wait to get, get excited and really set that up very soon. Um, but beyond that, guys, like I said before, um, as we're wrapping this up, the COVID-19 virus, COVID-19 is real. Vaccines are there. The boosters are there. They're free. That it, it, to a point where it's a no-brainer now. I don't know how else I can say this. I don't want to see another person in a hospital bed saying that they should have got the vaccine, wondering if they're going to make it through the night. Please, if not for yourself, do it for others because it's not just about you anymore. When you protect yourself, you protect others, and that's how we're going to get through this. So definitely get the vaccine if you haven't already gotten it. Get your booster if you haven't already gotten it. Help us help each other and get these numbers down in hospitals because it's not about the fact that people in the hospitals, it's not about the fact that we're burning out our nurses and doctors by the hour. It is also people... Is also individuals that do go in the hospital for life-saving medical treatments um, and surgeries and transplants. They are basically being held up because a person with COVID is occupying a bed. Every time we remove a person from COVID and get them on their way, we can actually keep other people alive that get the medical life-saving treatment that they need. So please, please, please do your part. That being said, guys, like I said, we're still going to continue these podcasts. I know usually around this time, I usually take off for the holidays and come back to New Year, but I said bump it. Let's just see what happens for me going full time throughout the holidays. So um, will there be a, will there be a December Eve podcast? Yes, there will be. Um, like I said before, we're going to run through the new year and see how it runs and just go from there. Aside from that, guys, the last thing I'll say about how the practice got here, it's all about staying informed. We are not trying to change minds, persuade individuals. Uh, we are simply doing what the old news stations of old try to do, what the news stations of old attempted to do, which is basically give you all the information allow you to make up your own mind for yourself, but also be able to give a very rational opinion about it. We do a lot. Of, we do actually do a lot more when we're informed. We're actually better when we're informed. We're progressive. We move forward. We try to right the wrongs of our past by making the decisions now that we should have done back then, like electing our first man of vice president who is black. Um, still hoping for Michelle Obama and her husband in 2024 because I'm sorry, no matter how you feel about it, we all felt a little better when Michelle Obama was in the White House. That being said, guys, please take care of yourselves and each other. And if you're watching this on the playback, please comment if it's live. I still know what you guys think. And like I said, when we take care of ourselves, we take care of each other. And that's how we get through this. Peace.